Uh, thank you, Amcham, for this honor. It's not often that an operator gets to share the same level um, on stage uh, with the honorable regulator, the challenges we have heard so far. But if I want to put things into perspective for you here, from, from a perspective of an operator and how I feel, because, because I, I do have some sympathy with the regulators here, and, and not just the SEC, and to be fair, you're hearing from SEC, who is one of the, I'm one of the more closer to the 4.0 regulator than a few other regulators in Thailand who are closer to 0 0.4 than 4.0. <laughs> I don't know, 4.0 being the main strategy of the name. And, and maybe as we may say, he's not being quoted on this. I'm, I'm happy to be quoted, but on a more personal basis. I'm not speaking on behalf of the stock exchange, nor on behalf of CLSA. So this is my personal viewpoint here today, just to share frankly the view with you. So this is not neither, neither the view of the, the exchange nor the CLSA. But many there, some of them do share similar kind of views in the background. The challenge I think the regulators here have, as you often know, is that when you go to a country, you have to appreciate sometimes the intricacies on the local sensitivity regard to the tradition, the culture, the way different businesses grow and operate. And different countries will have their own different uniqueness of the tailored way that you will see challenges. This government um, has a good big grand plan, and by government I mean the actual the government at the moment, um, being headed by General Prayut. And if you read into the detail of the national strategic plan, the 20 year plan, and you read deep into it, you will see it's well intended, and a lot of details in there have got so much, I would say, all the plan strategy heading in the right direction of where we should be heading for the future. Except that the future is now, and it's coming very fast, and the government may be struggling to find ways to implement certain steps to get there in a more timely manner. And this is causing some, some, some difficulty, because countries around us are waking up and embracing new technologies, not just embracing by using it, because Thailand is one of the countries where we totally embrace new technologies long before any other countries. You know, I think we are one of the largest uh, people who use Facebook actively, Line, social media, you name it, you know, many other ways that we use actively on, on, on that. H however, when it comes to the mindset, as uh, Pete Gav and Tim Suda have correctly pointed out, the mindset of the civil servants who need to drive this forward, it, it is tricky, it's difficult. You have to sympathize with them, because on the one hand, they're juggling with stability, the right to protect consumers, to regulate, to make sure that the environment of safety is there. And they're coming from a background of what? Of a Tom Yam Hu crisis in 1997. So therefore, from the background, when they regulate this, they think about how do we make sure that Thailand, as a country, financial institution, the financial system is stabilized. That is their primary concern. Of course, now they're wearing a second hat, which is the development hat. They're trying to develop industry, find out new challenges, and I'm, I'm actually great to see that our regulator is, is pushing and challenging the stock exchange to do more because as a board of member of the board of government and I spoke this openly, I want the stock exchange to, to grow up, to be more mature. We are 42 years old, but yet we are complacent. We have monopoly, so you're not getting time and they call it monopoly. So therefore we have no competition. And at times we become complacent about what we do at the stock exchange where the technologies elsewhere are running already forward. And of course, some of you may say, hey, I see always change may come and replace one day. It is a possibility, of course, and, and great if the FinTech Challenge brought out one of the blockchain writers who can, can write a program that will replace the stock exchange itself. So this is a great challenge that the management on a day-to-day -day level of the stock exchange has to think about how we operate and do this. The board director was in London last year to see all the new FinTech and the regulation in the UK, which is one of the more liberal and the more advanced in operating. And we are going to Israel, actually, tomorrow night. We're flying to Tel Aviv, we're flying to Turkey, then on to Tel Aviv, to see the FinTech ecosystem in Israel, to see how blockchain and how the FinTech ecosystem evolves there. I, I think there are more words that the, the SET itself um, will look into the future, because for me, personally, I'm definitely pro-competition in terms of the stock exchange itself to have more exchanges to be opened up to the to, to, to this, um, the new technologies that we need to use, um, especially the reform in the back office, um, the whole revolutionary, I would call, not just reform, but I think it's the whole, almost like a coup for the back office, because the, while the front office has gone through a lot of revolution, you see new products, new offerings for the private wealth management clients, the settlements, the custodians, the, all those record keepings, they need revolutionized way of keeping them and using that data. You know, the exchange itself has not monetized nor used the data as efficient as the London Stock Exchange 
or a few other exchanges in the world. So in that can definitely be, be, be used a bit more. Um, I will touch a little bit as well on, on, on the way that broker, brokers ourselves are operating. We have been definitely waking up to the way that our clients uh, choose to pay us at the asset management firms. They're paying brokers in different manners. Long gone to the day where traditional broking would pick up the phone, you know, sending emails, sending facts, sending ideas, and writing reports, and you would get paid. No, of course not. In this, in this is a day of where you're trading not against humans, but against robots, against robo-advisors, against people who sometimes don't need not impact by emotions. When the market is crashing, they know how to take advantage when the market volatile move. And often, there is a good size for that, but often it amplifies the volatility you're seeing in the stock markets you're seeing today. And it's definitely will amplify more going forward. There are more funds that are being launched, and not just traditional ETFs, products which are obviously leading to some market volatility at the close of the market. But there are funds who are linking more the strategy um, impact in terms of whether they look at the volumes, look at the price criteria, the arbitrage they can do, sometimes for the stocks that listed in different markets. So that there are funds that are coming to us and say, look, can we connect with you directly to a co-location business, high frequency trading, which are, have a frequency that the faster speed that will trade um, than the normal market participants. <coughs> there are funds that, that now, you know, asking us that, okay, yes, you know, you don't need a traditional read your report and, and, and pay you a traditional service, but all they want is just a, a structured product where we make sure that we guarantee the best price. Just purely just on flows, guarantee the flows, the blocks. So therefore it moves to a different ball game and the regulators in Europe have picked up this method, as you may have heard, the new regulation in Europe, which is even really, really tighter. So actually, the environment of regulations in Thailand and the region, relative to Europeans and America, on that front has been, has been kinder. The, the challenge we see though in Thailand, I think, for me personally, um, is one where, how do you cultivate a regulatory fairness? Fairness, what's the word, justice in the regulation. Because when the rule of law comes out, yes, it's for development, it has to be fair, and it has to be fair, and it has to be giving innovators a room to breathe and run before they get suffocated and die while the innovation hasn't gone allows the fintech, but not just fintech, any new startups uh, to run and get ahead of the game and, and run and compete. And they strike the right balance between creating an environment where you want that competition and that environment where collab collaboration can exist. Because on the one hand, you need some incumbents. And I tell you, incumbents are no longer dinosaurs. They're not. Long gone to the day where the bank CEO needs to look at their nose to talk about blockchains. They don't need that. You know, even Jamie Dimon now embrace cryptocurrencies or talk about all this stuff before he says it's a fraud. Now he say, hey, actually we may be able to use some of those blockchains. So there are bank CEOs who now, they, they're not dinosaurs, they, they know all this. So there are rooms, I think, that regulators have to look at in Thailand, how they can create an environment both in terms of a conducive regulatory environment where to both compete, allow the smaller firms to be able to compete and yet collaborate with the bigger guys, you will hear later from one of the bigger guys here in the room, <laughs> who will tell you how he can both collaborate and perhaps uh, also compete. Um, but, but, but for me, the regulators have to look at the whole picture from the bird's eye viewpoint. And I, I say this because, I give you an example, and, and apologies if I offend any American firms here, <laughs> with not, not my intention to, but I think those American firms do want to pay fair tax in Thailand. Tax in Thailand, we may have seen the headlines recently, the government has started to collect tax, or want to collect tax on cryptocurrency trading. Now, of course there are speculations in cryptocurrency trading. There are, like any uh, potential, crypto, uh, potential speculation in stock markets. So there are crypto exchanges in Thailand. Perhaps they should be paying tax, yes. But of course if those are paying tax, or should be paying tax, for the crypto traders or whatnot, you should also look at other companies who are operating in a new economy 4.0, who also should be paying tax. And by that, I mean, look at who are the largest advertisers in Thailand. Any guess? Who are the largest advertising company in Thailand? It's an American firm, Facebook. Actually, it's Alphabet, it's Google. It's Facebook, it's a Korean firm, Naver, Line, who owns Line. Those three are the largest advertising company in Thailand. How much tax are they paying? Anyone know? Zero. Well, Alphabet is paying 300,000 baht. Considering their billions in revenue. And no offense to them, actually, they want to pay tax. And by tax, I mean, they pay very simple thing. 
And there are big dominant players now, so they're not startups like you who can register in Singapore and pay a VAT. In Thailand, if you want to take out an advert with uh, Chong, uh, Channel 3 BC World with Thai Rat newspaper, one of the largest local newspapers, do you pay tax? You pay a VAT tax, 7%. If you want to take out an ad in Facebook, Google, and Line, do you pay tax? No. That's a big missing tax from the Ministry of Finance coffer. Please help me ask them why they're not rushing on that piece of collect tax collection. As much as rushing on the cryptocurrency tax collection. It's an open question. I'm not saying they're wrong to collect tax on cryptocurrency. There are people, there are regulators around the world who do collect tax from cryptocurrency traders. However, if you collect too early, they will go elsewhere. Cryptocurrency traders are not stupid. They do have ways to sell their assets abroad. They do have bank accounts abroad. So what I'm saying is sometimes is that in a, in, in, a, in a world where it's driven by technology and technology has no borders, are we regulating, you know, is the, is the conducive regulatory environment enough for this 4.0 regulatory environment? Dr. Gottsak Budapu uh, has been uh, commended for trying to do the regulatory DOT effort. And I commended him for trying on that. And that's why I told you all the blueprints, all the key national strategic direction is correct. The implementation is the real challenge. Because when the Gottsak say, I know what's blocking 4.0, he knows it. And it's the regulatory issues. Look at Korea. Why does Korea have Samsung? Why Phoenix? They don't have it just because they have better technology than Thai people. Thai people actually can write codes pretty well, by the way. There's a guy called Nguyen Barmin Inso, who's been brilliant. He studied John Hopkins. He was one of the top scientists in Thailand. You know, he graduated, worked for Microsoft, worked for the Thai army on the cyber security front. Then set up his own firm and wrote his own cryptocurrency called Satcoin. And then have a TDAX as an exchange, crypto exchange. So that people with, 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 with both the mindset, the ability, the aggression, the appetite to do their own entrepreneur. But uh, do the regulations allow them to prosper? You probably have seen the, the new, what they've done to him or to his exchange. Um, in Korea, over the last 30 years, there's a man called Dr. Scott Jacobs. He's American, by the way, American lawyers. If you haven't met him, you should meet him. Scott Jacobs has been credited for having setting up a career today. So basically, for every new law that's being introduced in Korea, one new law, two or three will be taken out. It's a called the regulatory DOT process. So you cut out unnecessary regulations, the old regulations. So Dr. Gottsak tried to do this. So we hired him for Thailand. Bank of Thailand, I think all of you, I think the SEC also worked with him. Um, yes. <laughs> so, but guess what? What is Dr. Gottsak hiring? There is a process of hiring. You need to go through a moral budget, which is a procurement law. Procurement, procurement decree in Thailand. The new procurement decree aims with good, well intended, to be transparent, to be non corrupted and all these sort of criteria. But guess what happened? The civil servants doesn't want to sign. So they say, oh, I'm scared to go to jail. I'm going to be in jail. So he wants to get the budget to buy the software from Scott Jacob to start his regulatory process. He can't even buy it. And this is uh, Dr. Gokbak, who is direct commandment from Dr. Sobkit, from the Deputy Prime Minister. He can't get the, the software. It takes a long time. But Dr. Scott Jacob has been hired for nine months. They can't even hire the right computer, the software to do this properly. So that is, for me, that is one example of, of the, the frustration that I think in the private sector we know the government mean well. But often if they get to reform, they have to tackle it heads on and reform perhaps the mindset that you mentioned and the civil servant itself. And the tax collection I mentioned, we haven't even gone to the sales tax, by the way. And this is the right, the balance that, that is tough to strike because one thing I'm not sure you're aware of is that the, one of the largest ICO raised by a Thai company is called Omise. And Omise raised a lot of funding in Switzerland through Ethereum platform, the ICO, the Omise coin. And, and of course, they couldn't do this in Thailand originally. There was no understanding, no trust, no, no nothing to do this. After they issued a cryptocurrency and I guess they didn't get any much press in Thailand on that cryptocurrency issue. The Prime Minister of Thailand actually gave them the Startup of the Award last year. It was a big uh, front page newspaper headline. Within one month of that award, the Prime Minister came and said, oh, cryptocurrency is fraud. <laughs> so it's a, it's a channel, so it's a, what do you call it, a Ponzi scheme. It's a Ponzi scheme, don't touch it. Again, as I say, there are Ponzi schemes within cryptocurrencies. I'm sure there are some coins which are 
But I think, as you probably all here know, the coin has two sides. And there is a useful, useful side, the blockchain system, the backup, and some good coins. And there are some naughtier guys who are definitely out there just to punt and to, to be a Ponzi scheme. But when the Prime Minister say that, I think for me, it sent out some of the difficult message to some of the startups or would-be companies that want to do business in Thailand, and then to, to want to raise money through the ICO, or the good work by the SEC, you know, the regulations, the, the, the hearing for the ICO. And some people are, are, are concerned on that front. Um, but and, and then afterwards, when we say come back to Thailand, people applaud. There's another company called Siam Organic. Siam Organic um, may not be a totally high-tech company, but it's a new economy company business. They couldn't raise money in Thailand. They go and raise money in the US and be famous in the US. And then they came back and be applauded and be, oh, you were a genius. You're... So Thai, Thai people sometimes have a mindset issue that we do applaud the Thais who have been successful abroad, then come home or, or applaud the successes from abroad, rather than have a a more mindset to, to really have this homegrown talent, um, especially in regard to new technology. So that, that is sometimes an, a tricky thing. Um, we haven't got the first unicorn locally groomed totally yet, whereas Indonesia have that Gojek. And Gojek is growing from just a, a, a delivery platform into a fintech platform now, if you're aware, acquiring some wallets and, and payment platforms. Um, could we have similar companies like that in Thailand growing? Um, the whole ecosystem, I think, perhaps need to be to, 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 to be improved. One point I will touch before I finish is that I think regulators in Thailand, and I again, as I say, I, I have all the highest respect for, for the Bank of Thailand, who is the, the banking regulators. High respect because without them, I wouldn't be here today. You may wonder why I say that because my parents both worked there and they met each other and fell in love with the Bank of Thailand and married. So, <laughs> but without the Bank of Thailand and the scholarship they gave to my father, I wouldn't be here today. Um, with that grateful in mind, I think, I think there's a lot of smart people and a lot of honest and well-intended people there. The challenge they have now is how do they balance between protecting the stability of the big financial companies who are operating in Thailand versus the ones who are growing and competing and will be, and already are competing and some will be competing with those financial institutions. It is a tough balance because, give me an example of peer-to-peer -peer lending. A peer-to-peer -peer lending, we have no one who wants to take charge of this regulation in Thailand, the Ministry of Finance say, oh, it's a bank Thailand job, and oh, no, it's your job, your job. And so they haven't, it's not the SEC who's doing the equity side of things, already done on the equity side, but on this lending side, the loans, the debt side, who is going to regulate that? You know, Indonesia, they already have uh, peer to peer lending, Philippine has it. There's a company called Oriente, which operates in Hong Kong. The founder is one of the co founders of Ethereum. It's a proven technology, it's a true peer to peer. So if you know peer to peer, sometimes there are companies that, a lot of companies are pseudo peer to peer. So some of them are real institutional money in disguise and try to sink that through the regulation arbitrage, try to get the loophole and just a finance company. There are real peer to peer guys who want to operate. And Thailand is a country, classic country, where a lot of good ideas from the small medium enterprise and smaller guys need better funding or better, better funding platform or access to funding. It's very tricky. Especially this is an area where I think the rural area has rooms to grow the fastest. You know, for us in Thailand, the unbanked or the guys who can't reach those funds but with good ideas in the rural areas need better service on that front. I know the government is trying to do a village uh, bank and a Tanjung Chon community, local community bank. Um, that's a good idea, but there are also technologies that can help push it faster because everyone in the rural uses mobile phone. They're beginning to use more smartphone. Smartphone price will come down. So I hope that this peer-to-peer -peer lending eventually would get a, a, good, a good regulation um, amidst uh, appreciating the culture tradition of each country. You know some countries that say ban ICO, like China? They, they don't actually ban cryptocurrency. If you look into the detail, China has a coin called NEO, and that coin is being traded. The Chinese would do it their way. They have, they, they ban Google, Facebook, Line, WhatsApp, all the stuff, Instagram. But what do they have? They have Tencent, they have WeChat. They have Baidu, they have Alibaba. So China will do it. They're, they're one of the smartest out there in terms of this uh, innovation and letting it run. India does it a different way, of course. You know, your government has been very smart at, at the Modi has been very smart at opening up uh, India 4.0 truly by e-cataloging um, billions of your population and have this central KYC that companies like Bajaj Finance can lend, can decide if they would grant you a loan within minutes of you going on their platform if you allow them to click the approve button. Remember, banks own your, uh, your ID or your information. And information in the digital age is gold mines. And that data is now being used for the public. 
at large to the benefit of the public to access more capital. Bajaj Finance, by the way, is a listed firm. The stock, needless to, needless to say, has gone up, I think, 20 times over the last four or five years in India, and probably needs to double from here. Um, Singapore, they've used the data, public transport data, they open it up to grab an Uber to use it. For what? For better public service. So they can have a grab chair bus. So now they have grab bus or sharing rides, which I think Thailand also has like Pamba share, Pamba share where you go through apps. They're doing the ride sharing at the moment. But it's, you know, they're not getting access to this uh, data possibility that we talk about in the FinTech regulations. Would it be enforced? Is there punishment if the government agencies don't hand over the data in time? How quick should they hand over the data? The use of data would be crucial and important in how government collect data and store it and, and record it properly. That, that would be, I think, would define the eventuality of the successes. But I think Thailand will have our own ways to go about doing this. And Bank of Thailand, yes, they are skeptical on cryptocurrency just only because, obviously, within the, the ruling powers have some concerns on the security front. Um, but they are open up to a little bit because people also some kid, his son is doing cryptocurrency stuff. <laughs> and he, he admitted that to us. We were in the meeting with him together. And he frankly speak openly about this. I mean, you know, he, he very pushing on, on understanding. He said, he, say, he say we can't stop the young Gen Z from, from doing what they're doing. He knows this. So this is the number one guy. He gets it. You know, now it's just how do we, the public has to help also. And I hope you know you will hear later from Jema, Jason Coin, of how the good ICO was set a good precedent. Um, solid one. There is another one coming up, the Carbonium, I believe, on the social trading platform, which is very interesting. And the SEC has looked at this social trading platform that are already happening in the US and UK. So that's also an interesting um, ICO to come up in time. There's a few series of them, and I hope that they would, would set a good precedent. I, I think the, the, the authority has to think about the long-term implications and we not take a wrong turn. Because what the wrong turn is happening, as you mentioned, is um, what I fear is um, overregulation. And, and we've talked about it about, about intricacy of tradition in different countries. But um, for, for, for Thailand, I, 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 I feel that, as I mentioned, the Korea example, you know, the, the lesser, and if you study worldwide, the lesser the regulations or licenses there are, the higher the competitiveness of that economy will become, and the vibrancy and the economy will prosper from the entrepreneur. Of course, then how do you strike the balance? Um, part of it, I, I, I would hope, and I would urge the Bank of Thailand, I'm sure the SEC beginning to do this, is to begin to strike up partnerships, meaningful partnerships. You know, the Malaysian um, authorities, both on the regulated front, um, the bank, the Central Bank of Malaysia, have already struck up a key relationship with Australian market, with the US, and the Singapore Monetary Authority of Singapore has struck up with the Bank of Canada on the payment and the cross-border transactions. Um, they have struck up a relationship with a few other um, countries um, around the world who has better technologies than them. And, and that exchanges mean that whenever fintech firms or new economy firms want to raise capital or come and do business in Singapore, it becomes easier. And vice versa, if Singaporean homegrown talents want to raise capital from the world or from those markets who get it or understand this newer technology, it becomes easier. So that kind of a, a good partnership, I think, I think, I think needs to be struck. It also makes them understand and keep up to date and up to speed with regulations elsewhere around the world, then you, you never, regulators will never ever be ahead of all these entrepreneurial businesses. I mean, they will run faster and they will get ahead of it. And regulators should allow that to prosper before to have guidelines or, or some form. There are sandbox that can happen, yes, although often at times to get sandbox licenses itself is not the easiest thing in the world either. So sometimes I think some businesses already started operating um, um, without, without the sandbox and go ahead with it. As long as you say, like in Singapore, for example, if it doesn't meaningfully impact the economy or the ecosystem at large will impact the big, large consumers, then they let it run for a while and see. And often the culture has to accept failures. Thai people sometimes look down upon people who fail from education level. You know, people who top of the class and good students get applauded, get accolades, get to put in the class, like um, we call it the uh, Hong King, Hong Queen. We have a king and queen room for the top students. But it's often the entrepreneur and the smart guy, the whiz kid, the one who are truly creative and the naughtier ones, the ones who fail, who get grade Z or F. <laughs> so, the, the, you know, I'm not saying they're weird, they're good ones, and although I met, I met this guy Vitalik, uh, the Ethereum founder in Thailand, and he was a bit interesting, he, he failed a few exams, but he did, he did sound a few weirdo stuff, but, 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 but that, that Thai society, and I'm sure Adi has to learn and, and accept failure, and, and, and of course of, of their businessmen, you know, some businessmen fail generally not because they're crooks, 
or because they're fraud, but they fail just because the that business models may be ahead of the time or maybe just the wrong timing. But they fail and get up and fail again and fail again and get up, get up. They may fail many times. Some of the best creators in the world, you know, Albert Einstein, so whatever, fail many times before they succeed. So that culture of acceptance and has to has to uh, for me take into account and society as well. We take a look at that because the whole re regulatory issue for me personally for the technology goes beyond the actual digital economy itself because it is the human who use the technology. It is the Ministry of Education who has to change and improve and modify that curriculum, that education, if we are to prosper and get the new mindsets into the people to accept the fintech world. It is the Ministry of, um, of, course of Finance to look at ways to allow new ways of funding the venture cap, the new source of funds to go cross border. It is the Ministry of Commerce who should allow foreign firms to own majority stake in fintech firms in Thailand. It's still being banned. I had a crowdfunding platform, you know this company, uh, Sinpatana Phoenix, Greg Hong Sin from Singapore. She has a wonderful technology from Singapore. She set up in Thailand and she couldn't get anywhere because for the last one year she had to get a foreign business license from the Ministry of Commerce. She owns a majority stake in the company. And the need to operate that business in Thailand, you need to get an FBL license. To get an FBL, you go to the Ministry of Commerce. To get that license, you need to go to the Board of Investment, BOI. BOI took her nine months plus for crowdfunding platform. And then come back another few months at the Ministry of Commerce and then come back perhaps to get the crowdfunding license from the SEC. It takes her the whole process of a year and a half. By now, her business is dormant, it's dead because ICOs everywhere. <laughs> so her business is finished almost in a way. So she has to rethink about how the business is moving. So this is just an example where where regulators and regulation will play a very key role. I thought Facebook's already using our data for free. <laughs> and so are Thai banks. So, I mean, for me, it should be more open and free and open to use in an in, in, in a, in a appropriate manner using blockchain, for it, like your government has done in India. So India has been very, I would commend you know, the government of India to, to actually e catalog and allowing that use of, 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 of public uh, data if you authorize. So if you say, Vinay wants to have an account and use the service for judge finance, then you click approve. And if your consent, it's under your consent, not under the bank's consent to have the right to use your data to come up with creative financial services, which then they sold it back to you. So, 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 so for me, I mean, the use of data, yes, there are some concerns of privacy and whatnot, but I think I gave you an example of Singapore government, how they gave the traffic data away. I, I think the FinTech law, the success of this, the new executive decree, would depend on, on the disclosure and the possibility of data and how the timely, and there should be a punishment for in there. I believe in the decree there's no punishment, nor the forcing the timeline of how quick the government must hand over the data. So the, the mindset of Thai corporate family owners to change on, on the risk appetite, on the risk, on how they view what is the cost. Thai families, corporates, typically view investments as cost. I give you an example when I think ex-Prime Minister Yi Lak gave a corporate tax reduction six years ago, five, five and a half years ago. Guess what most corporates do? They get a one-off one -off tax cut. Guess what they do? They pay a special dividend. Most of them pay back a special dividend. A lot of Thai corporates listed in the Thai Stock Exchange of Thailand are commended for having nice juicy dividend yield. But that comes to the expense of research and development R&D. And that mindset within the investment risk appetite or the, 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 the ability to both take a bit of a bold move, a bit of a leap of faith as much as, as looking at this investment as not just cost, you know, hit your bottom line straight away. A company called Delta um, has majority owners be foreign. They are a bit more daring. They invest in new electric vehicle charging stations at electric batteries. Once they announce it, the share price has been hit. All the last one year, it's been hit straight away. But recently it's recovered a little bit, where people are now, oh wow, EV is the future, now it's gonna happen. So the share price is coming back, saying, oh, you have, you have a foresight uh, to see that coming. Even though when they had the foresight a year and a half, two years ago, to start doing the EV batteries and charging stations, the shareholders punished them for making that investment. But I think in incrementally over the last few years, I think Thai corporates are, especially the ones who are in the technological field, like True Corporation, InTouch, um, are beginning to be a bit more creative about deploying their assets or their cash pile that they have. And the corporate venture capital mentality that, that InTouch already seeded some, like B and a few other firms uh, within the startup space uh, is encouraging. I just hope that, you know, even PTT, Siang Simen, all these guys are joining, even Van Poo, you know, even in one crucial area that I want them to have is the corporate venture capital that sees not just company of new business or innovation technology, but company that has social innovation. Because 
digital economy is good, but digital divide is bad. And a country like Thailand, you are going to see an acceleration of inequality if regulators do not take a, a good look at this. Because there are people who have and have not, and there are people who have and have more with technology like this. So I hope that corporate venture capital landscape, and that's one thing that Stock Exchange in Thailand is trying to do, I'm trying to push them to do, we set up a 1 billion baht fund for CBC, the corporate venture capital fund. And we're looking at ways how to support the social entrepreneurs, the social enterprises. A lot of them are using new technology, new platform. But the beautiful thing about Thailand is how you combine the 0 0.4 with the 4.0. And by that I mean because we have to know what our strength is. Thai people know that our strength is not 4.0. I've already discussed why it's not. The strength is in 0.4. It's in empathy. It's in smiling. It's in taking care. It's in servicing. That is the inherent strength of the Thai people. You still have to use that network of family network and, and kindness and hospitality. And I'll give you one example of the company that's using that work. Local Alike. Local Alike won the Ban Phu Social, Social Entrepreneur Business Award a couple of years back. And Kun Pai uh, should be commended. And, if any of you have not used that service, you should use it, local alike, L-O-C-A-L-A-L-I-K-E. So they use technology to sell, and they try to hook up to Agoda. And you know Agoda was founded in Phuket, a couple of foreigners having holidays in Phuket, and founded Agoda in Phuket. So he hooked up to Agoda, and hooked up to the technological platform. Effectively, he sells local community-based tourism. So he's selling the stuff that Thai is good at, and looking at hidden gems, some of the cities that are not as well visited, also some well visited cities, but which spots are more family oriented, more homegrown talents, more like mom and pop style shop, allowing the local community to grow and prosper with the tourism industry. Because most of the time with the tourism industry, people who make the money for the five star hotels and the uh, tour operator, the big tour operator, how do you then use technology to close that inequality or the income gap is crucial for me. Because that's what technology should be there for and what digital economy should be all about. It's about allowing the connectivity to make the lesser, the smaller guys more connected and well off and getting a higher income share from the capitalism, so to speak. So I, I'm seeing good trends in time in some company, but I'm hoping the CBC will not just you know, be just a risk taker of those, but also look at the social impact angle. Maybe we might be very direct on that, is that most of the public services should be run privately. So meaning that a lot of the stuff in prom pay, I think should be done privately. But I know traditionally, again, coming back to the culture tradition point, better than what prom pay has done so far. But that point aside, I, I, I still think that most of the, the, the new stuff, let, let the competition prosper, let the private sector um, um, run um, a lot of this uh, uh, stuff. The government needs to stand back and make sure that the regulations allow and facilitate the use of up-to-date speedy technology from around the world. And make sure that, that partnerships, technologies, flow in and happen as a partnership. And fine, you can monitor that, you can regulate that in the end. But at first, there needs to be a network and, and, and free flow of technologies and partnership. I give you a sample of ASEAN um, FinTech Innovation Network. I think AFIN is called AFIN, which I think a lot of the um, monetary authority around the world beginning to be partnered with this ASEAN uh, FinTech Innovation, Finance Innovation Network, AFIN. You should Google and check up on them because a lot of the fintech companies and a lot of governments are beginning to work together because a lot of the fintech firms, their issue is they can't scale, and especially scale across borders. This network should allow them to enhance that, that possibilities. And as I mentioned earlier, technology should have no borders, no boundary, and the regulations, um, they need to talk with each other and catch up more on the, on the network to be up to date, to speed. Because while regulators can never be up to speed with all the entrepreneurs, they can at least um, use uh, the, the better example of how regulators in other countries work to perhaps drive through and influence some of the changes in our countries like Thailand where we often applaud the, the success of foreigners or the success of foreign firms and regulations in a good way, you know, in a good way. So there are a lot of good samples um, foreigners have, have done, perhaps executed better than us, implement better uh, policies on digital economy fronts than Thailand and to form that network and to use that. And also I think it's crucial also on this issue is to have a credible research institute on fintech. Thailand used to have ATI, the Asian Technology Institute, ATI, and now it's kind of gone down in terms of the standings and reputation perhaps over the last few years. But it is crucial if the Eastern Economic Corridor EEC or the new Silicon Valley of Thailand in Silacha, the 700 ride plot, were to succeed, they must need a credible academic institution 
And that institution needs to drive innovation and research networks around the world. Because once you have the research network, then policy makers can decide and have a credible policy based on the data and information, rather than based on connections and collusions and on favoring some big or whatever conglomerates that there may be out there. So I think it is a room for both policymakers to grow up and have that, that credible institution as a, as a kind of research academic background.